Hello everybody from the channel. I have a pleasure of being here today with Sue Bingham. Uh, there is a, a specialist in leadership, constructing teams and better teams. And first of all, Sue, thank you for accepting my invitation. It was something that I wanted to do for so long. We are trying to work on the schedule and finally we were we are able to make it. Uh, and can you please tell to our followers uh, your background and how did you get where you are today? Uh, wow, I started out about 35, 40 years ago working in uh, at the Ohio State University, but I, I was working in the human resources function. And I went from there to working for a big company called Abbott Labs. Um, I think they're global and um, probably would have spent the rest of my career there, but I wanted to live in California. So I moved to San Diego and found a job with a very large aerospace company. And from there, I again was working in HR. I met uh, my mentor who exposed me to a very different way of looking at human resources. Um, and once I saw that, I could never go back. Um, so, you know, we, we take an approach that we're dealing with adults and that they're, um, we have positive assumptions about them. Um, we don't have lots of silly rules. We, we don't monitor and try to control behavior. Um, so that's, that was the exposure I had, and we were opening plants all over the country with this philosophy, with this approach, and those plants outperformed every other, every, every other existing plant there was, even while they were on a learning curve. So the, the productivity and the performance was extremely high. Um, did that for a lot of years and then decided that more companies needed exposure to this than just the company I was working for. So I started my own business. It's called HPWP Group. Um, the HPWP stands for High Performance Workplace. Um, we wrote a book and we've been consulting with um, large and medium-sized companies ever since then. So when you first started working in this new position in California, what were the, the main uh, background that you brought from, from the companies that didn't uh, work at the same way? So what were they doing differently that brought the new results in your opinion? Uh, well, first of all, it was a union company. So about 3,500 employees were you know, under contract. Um, it's a union agreement and then the other 3500 were salaried employees and at first i worked with the salaried employees but even working with them there was uh there were lots of rules um you know there were uh there was a, a rule book that was this big and one of our jobs in employee relations was to make sure that people followed the rules. And um, I just hated that role. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what I encountered when I got there. And of course, it was even worse with the labor contract because the labor contract, if you read any kind of union agreement or labor contract, What's happened is it's filled with every time someone in management or, or one of the employees did something the other didn't like. So as soon as somebody did something the other didn't like, management did something that the employees didn't like or the union didn't like or vice versa, and one employee did something that the management didn't like, they put it into a rule. And so a whole, if you look at a labor agreement, it's just filled with all these little one-time things that somebody did that were wrong or bad and but now we got to make a rule to try to prevent it from happening again so that's what i found i found a very very restrictive uh organization 
because of the rules, it was very fear-based, so psychologically not safe. Um, management was afraid to speak up to the next level of management. So it, everything from creativity to psychological safety to um, any kind of sense of accomplishment was really shut down by that kind of an approach. And it was at that aerospace company where I met uh, the mentor who brought a completely different approach. Um, and, and we've used that ever since. Yes, uh, we work in the, in the safety field and most of the, the situation you described is, fits perfectly to our world, you know. So when somebody gets hurt or something uh, that is uh, out of the procedure happens, we just come with more controls and more procedures. And most of the time it's not to fix this, the previous situation, it's just to create some kind of protection or for the company or for the management or for uh, whatever. But uh, as you just mentioned, we don't learn anything from this uh, new controls and also we lose productivity because we have a lot of paperwork to fill. And as I just said, the same happens for HR or any other part of the, the company. Since we recognize this kind of problem, what's the first thing to do in order to, to try to create a better uh, workplace for people? Well, the, the first thing is you have to have a senior management person. Your, your company leader or organization leader has to be someone who, who cares about people, to be very frank. And I'm not trying to be touchy-feely, but they, they need to really value people and value people as their competitive edge. If they are, and if they have courage, and if they have vision, they'll engage in communicating those kinds of values. Um, what we do is a, a leadership workshop that's really designed to change mindset. Because you can teach people a behavior or a skill, that doesn't mean they're gonna do it particularly if you've got an environment that doesn't support them doing it. Um, what, what we need to do is change their mindset so that they do it because they want to. So we work with leaders to change their mindset that says, look at 95% of the people you work with are responsible, good people. 95%. They may not always show up on their best day, but they're good people. And there's 5% of the people who aren't. But we have to stop making our rules around trying to catch the 5% and focus on the 95%. And we start that with saying, have positive assumptions. Um, if you accept that 95% of the people that work with you are good, responsible people, then treat them that way. Don't burden them with a lot of rules. Don't burden them with I tell you do. Um, engage them, respect them, reward, reinforce. Um, this is all just plain basic stuff. Uh, but at least in the U.S., the reason it got so bad is because of the lawsuits. And, you know, a uh, bad apple can sue a company and even if they don't win, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars if it goes to trial. So companies have built in all these things to try to prevent uh, lawsuits, which the problem is that in the process of that, they've created a culture where people don't feel valued. The 95% don't feel valued. Yes, you just described the second uh, main uh, philosophy of our safety uh, channel, that is the safety one and two. I don't know if you heard about it, but the safety one is based on controls and seeing employees as a problem. Uh, there are the 5% and the safety two is seeing them as a solution and working for, for them. And what we realize, at least me, 
is that when you create uh, new rules and controls in order to control this 5%, you actually increase these numbers because the part of the 90%, 95% starts migrating for, because yes. they're already suffering the, the consequences of these controls. And they say, if I was working well and I've been penalized, then I'm, I'm start working badly. Does it make sense? Yes, it, it makes absolute sense. And I guess a good way to look at it would be, um, you know, here lots of companies have sick pay. And um, what happens with, with sick pay is there, there are people who wouldn't miss work if they had no reason to miss work. They would come to work every day. When the people who want to get as much as they can from the company that take advantage of all the sick days that they're paid for, then, then the good employees say, well, you know, I've got five, might as well call in sick one day and take a, an extra vacation day. Um, so what, what happens is that, that the, if we, <laughs> we do a, a thing where we say, um, think about your top 10 performers, your top 10. Think of their names. Think about your lower three, uh, no, not top 10, I'm sorry, top three performers and your lowest three performers. And there's probably a pretty big gap. If the top performers are doing uh, 100% of what you would expect, how much are the lower performers doing? And people will tell us anything from zero to 50, <laughs> but a lot less. But, you know, there's a big gap there. And then we say, well, is there, is there a gap in pay? I mean, do they get that much more pay? Do these guys get 50% more pay? No, they don't. Do they get 50% more attention? No. Um, what they get is more work. Um, because they can be counted on. And the guys that get the attention are these lower performers, and it's been proven that, that uh, no attention, that negative attention, is better than no attention. Wow, that's new. <laughs> yes. So, you know, the lowest performers are being reinforced in all kinds of ways, and the high performers... Are, are being punished, so to speak, or certainly not rewarded for their work. Yes, I, I, I tell this to my friends. Sometimes they say, hey, can I, lean, can I lean on you for this and that? And I'm always saying, yes, yes, yes. And if they need to do something bad to somebody, they'll pick me. And I say, why me? No, oh, because you are a friend, you are gonna understand. <laughs> so I say, there's no advantage <laughs> of being reliable or being your friend. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no advantage to being good. <laughs> no advantage on being good, yeah, perfect. And so another question that uh, I always, always is on my mind is, if most of, I, I'm guessing, most of the, the work environment and the leaders, uh, they, as a sick person, they don't recognize that they are sick or something like that. They don't see that they are doing poorly on performance or as a workplace. Uh, could you help us uh, uh, to understand some symptoms of what is, uh, is driving or what uh, make the, the what makes a, a workplace uh, not a high performance workplace? How can we recognize this? Well, it's been to and you feel an energy in a high performance workplace. You can see it. People greet you, they make eye contact. There's, there's uh, just a sense of energy. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear laughing um, because people have fun at work. Um, that's, that's how you can tell. Um, if you're at a, at a manufacturing facility, um, you can tell because when the shift is over, people sort of amble out and other people sort of amble in. 
versus in a traditional environment when the shift is over you don't want to be by the door because you'll be trampled with people <laughs> running on the way out so uh, the, it's something you something you see and then of course it's reflected in the numbers it's reflected in the performance um, bottom line top line efficiencies uh, all those measures um, when you make readily available to the people who are responsible for achieving them, they all want to win. And so they work to win. So that's, I, did I answer your question? Yes, perfectly, totally. And uh, that's something that we, we need to, it was good that you mentioned because it's kind of some of, of the managers or the, the high leadership they see laughing at the workplace, at least in the past, I don't know if today is still like this, as some kind of uh, not treating the, the work as a serious as it needs to be, or it's to inform or something like this. Uh, do you see this in US as well? Is this a problem to, to be solved since people are, uh, at least here, it's becoming more horizontal. People are not concerned about uh, the hierarchy as it used to be in the past. I, I think that's changed um, too. Um, in all the studies we've done on the future of work, um, hierarchies ultimately will be a thing of the past. Um, it will be more networked, more more gig work, um, and and we've got a jump start on that with COVID. But that's 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 happening. That's one of the one of the few good outcomes from this crisis is that it's forced companies to start working in a different way and having to trust and work with people that are working remotely. You know, it's a pretty negative assumption about people that they have to be within your view so you can monitor their activity. Um, who wants to work under that scenario? Um, so that's that's helped, although um, we have been facing here, uh, one of the articles I read was that equity measuring software was flying off the shelves, that companies were buying all this software to try to measure the productivity of their people. And, you know, that's just completely in their option. Um, and, and what's going to happen is, as this newer generation comes up, um, they're not going to have tolerance. They're going to be far more open to different work schedules, flexibility, those kinds of things. They're going to be more open to that, and they're going to be more agile as a result. And in that sense, they're going to be more competitive. And some of these really big companies that are very and control oriented are, are going to have trouble uh, remaining competitive because they're, they're too big and too slow and they're too set in their ways. Yes. So that's something that I totally agree and I have talked to some friends uh, because I don't know if it's a, a misunderstanding from the past that companies used to buy hours from the employees and not uh, deliveries. So in the US it's still like this, in Brazil it's not so common. So if you uh, like hire somebody to produce a book, for example, and the people produce the book, for us it would be okay, I hired you to, buy the, to produce the book, but people say no, if you are producing the book in two hours and the other eight that I bought you are not doing anything, that doesn't work for me. And the COVID times are, are like changing everything about it. And so the question is, what's the best thing that a, um, a leader or a manager can do with to, to better manage his team that is working from home in this crisis? Um, well, first is to have positive assumptions that if, if that manager's hired these people, he, he or she hired them for a reason because they believed they were competent and they were reliable and they were good people. So based on that, they should have trust 
that if they're clear about their expectations, that people will work to meet those. And if, especially during COVID, if they've got kids at home or whatever, I mean, people will be working different hours. People will work later in the night. Some people will be able to work faster than others, but the key is that the results are there. And the best thing the manager can do is with those positive assumptions, maintain contact and maintain that role of how can I support you? And what is it you need and what works best for you? Um, one of our fears is that people will come back to a one size fits all. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll allow, allow remote work um, three days a week. And then everybody has to be in the office two days a week. Well, uh, the, the good news is that that may be really wonderful for some people, but doesn't mean it's best for everyone. And so the key thing for a manager to do is look at their team as a unique entity that's got a purpose and a charter and encourage them and support them in achieving it. And if there's, if there's a problem, you talk in a problem solving way and say, you know, as an example, I've noticed that um, you're behind on this particular project. Tell me what's going on and listen to what they have to say. And if it's, if it's valid, you adjust the timeline. If it's not valid and it's more like an excuse, you got to probe a little further and say, mm, I, I think something more is getting in the way. Tell, tell me what's getting in the way. And you keep probing for the cause. And then if you think you found that, the manager says, um, what do you want to do to fix it? How, how, how will you fix that? It's not the manager's responsibility to tell them how to fix it. It's up to that adult to say, well, what I, what I need to do is, is this, and here's what I'll do, and I'll commit to that. And then the manager says, great. Um, I'm confident you'll achieve that, or at the very least, they say, I hope this will work. And they make a few notes, and that's it. It's not some written warning. It's not some, I don't know if you guys have PIPs, performance improvement plans. It's, yes. you, don't, you don't do that. You talk to the adult, and you figure out fairly quickly if it's an issue of capability or if it's an issue of willingness. And if they're not really willing, you don't need to spend a lot of time on it. You can have a very adult up front and say, I'm, I'm not hearing you taking personal accountability for this. Uh, it doesn't sound to me, I, we can't seem to get at a cause of this. Um, I want you to really think in the next 12 hours um, about if this is a job you want. And if it's a job you want, great. Let, I, I want you to come back to me with, with how to catch up, how to, how to make the necessary changes. If it's not a job you want, you know, that, that's okay too. Tell me and we'll, we'll process your separation. But it's, it's rather than building up documentation files that are this big, trying to catch those guys that don't really care, you know, that the five percenters, the bad apples. I mean, for them, it's a playbook. Um, you know, I can do this, or if it's an attendance thing and people have attendance point systems, which are stupid, but if they, if a company says, well, you can, once you've missed three times, um, it's a written warning, you, you've got three points, or, you know, they do all these kinds of, of, of uh, lay out this, this playing field, this structure that the five percenters love. I mean, they can just play around with it and take as many days off as they can, as long as they get, you know, one more day in. Um, and yet it's, it's not helpful to the 95% and it treats them like kids. And they're not. I totally agree. And, and also, uh, uh, I've never been into a, a peep, as, as you mentioned. And also, uh, from the companies I, I know and my friends work and they tell me, I never been anybody being recovered from a peep. Right. So it's something that is decided already. You are just trying to create some documentation, but you never say, "Hey, this really worked for 
for Hugo, let's give him right. our manager managerial position. It's uh, if he, as you said, it saves time and, and effort. Uh, but I'm not an EHR person. Uh, I I have a, a degree, a bachelor degree in this, but I never worked in this field. So uh, it's good to listen from you because it was never made sense for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to. Uh, any thinking adult. And that's who most of our work population is, and we've just got to start treating them like that. But if I'm in the situation of being, uh, <laughs> like, if I need a peep, I would like to be through this, you know, so just to give, give me more time, just for my company to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to be safe. So, yes. Sue, uh, another question that, uh, by the way, you've been answering a lot of safety questions because it is exactly the same thing we face during our investigations and our conversations. We tend to treat people as children. We tend to try to find somebody to blame and we try to do things, uh, solving things, pressing the easy button and we pretty much know it never works, you know. So you just change the name of the the problem, but they stay there. And the next question is: You've been working with a lot of companies in this, uh, uh, or in order to create a better a better workplace for people to to work. Uh, but we know that in some cases it's something at least I, 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 I think in some cases it's not going to happen because we have, I don't know, we can have more uh, bad apples than, than good apples or, or, you know, the leader is not supporting you and everything. Uh, so how can we recognize this kind of situation in order to move on and to try, if I'm, if I'm an employee in a situation like this and time for me to look for something new or it's not going to happen? Think I think it, I've spent 30 years beating my head against managers who didn't want to change. And um, I, I, I'm not interested in doing that. There are plenty of people who do. They just need to be shown the way. And so mine is more of a search. Um, now, it's really the senior managers because we can get the middle managers through our workshop where we change their mindset and they leave feeling completely different because mindsets change. They're valuing people. Um, we do an exercise where we call it a, a listening exercise, but it's not really where we send pairs off to talk about an important day in their life. Then we have them come back. This happens about midweek. We have them come back and then they share that partner's story about what was their most important day. By the end of sharing those stories, the, the, uh, the f closeness in the room and the respect that people have for, for each other is huge. So one of the things we say to managers is, you know those old traditional books that say don't get close to your employees? Well, that's belonging. You know, we're going to be asking people to put themselves out. We're going to be asking them to make sacrifices. And if we don't care about them and we don't care about their family, uh, we, we can't have those expectations. Um, and then, of course, what happens is it's a self-fulfilling thing. If, have those, if, if we see that people are going to give you everything because you treat them like a number, then we start having negative assumptions about them. Well, people don't want to work. They're really lazy. They're blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, uh, it's self-fulfilling. So in answer to your question, going back, we need to focus on those who have courage, have a vision, and who value people. And we need to sort those out and find those people. Um, they're already probably doing a good job of leadership. Let's give them a little more help with their middle management because their middle management probably didn't always work for somebody like them. Yeah. Uh, 
when I first became a manager, I had a lot of concerns about being uh, accepted by the team and, and everything because I was one of them. And then like this, I was trained to be a technical professional. I'm a, I have a, a business degree and an engineering degree and a safety degree and everything, but never ever had anything related to management, working teams or something like this during my official uh, educational process. Uh, fortunately, I, I like philosophy and politics as we talked before. So I have kind of learned from uh, uh, myself, uh, reading stuff and, and everything. And also I, I like people, uh, what makes everything easier because liking, liking people is the key for me. But for, for the person that is in, in the situation of uh, being promoted, receiving a team, sometimes with difficult people, people that are not accepting them, they wanted to be in his place. Uh, what would you suggest for this, for the person in this situation to do? Um, well, typically I would have said that um, that's one of the roles that human resources is a coach to those folks with how human resources operates right now. They're more policy driven. Um, I would say that that person needs to find a good mentor. If they really want to work at that company, find a mentor. Um, it certainly might not be their direct boss, but it might be someone that, that they can learn from, that can coach them through, or leave. Um, I think the days of for one company your whole life are gone. Um, but I do think that uh, people, it's more of an employee market now. You can, you can be more thoughtful about what jobs you take. And we coach people to interview the company. I mean, I understand the company's interviewing the employee. I think the employee has a right to interview the company. And one of the things I, I suggest is when they, when they say, um, you know, we really value people, you know, if I have, you know, I would say a good question in an interview is to say, tell me about your company's culture. I mean, tell me, tell me how decisions are made. And then ask to see the employee handbook. And if it's filled with lots of rules and it's all geared toward the 5%, you can pretty much figure out you've got a pretty traditional cult. Now, that doesn't mean it's terrible. It doesn't mean it's awful. But it's also not going to allow you to reach your full potential. And it won't be as much fun. doesn't work for me. I, I like to be in a fun place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've got you've got to be working for people that you respect and whose values match yours, and that's why the companies that continue to operate in this command and control style will will long term not be successful. I saw a really good statistic, Hugo, that of the S P five hundred companies here in the United States, the average. Uh, lifespan of those companies used to be 67 years. The average was 67 years. They were in business. The average lifespan now is 15. It's too high compared to Brazil. <laughs> so, so I just think that says, a, you know, it, it says that you can continue to keep doing things the way you've been doing them if you're senior managers. You can continue your short-term focus, your quarterly earnings, your um, efficiencies for the day. You can be focused on those things. And when it's a crisis like this, you can just cut numbers. Let's cut training. Let's cut our focus on speed. Let's, let's lay off people. Um, and, and that's just a terrible mistake. We're going to be doing a webcast with two uh, chief financial officers and a UK CEO on the next few weeks that says, look at retrenchment um, and lay 
the only thing to do. And you've got, we've got lots of stories where you can engage the employee population and whether it comes to, you know, self um, furloughing, whether it comes to let's figure out how to take cost out of the organization as a group because the employees doing the work know where there's duplication. They know where there's wasted effort. They know where there's wasted. Um, it's just we don't ask them. Yeah. Um, you, you start engaging them, they're going to find kinds of ways. Um, they're going to find ways to work together. They're going to come up with creative ways to do it. But um, unfortunately, when there's an economic crisis, the, the senior leader goes behind a closed door. They look at the bottom line, not the top line, but the bottom line. And they say, okay, to get to this number now that's acceptable, we're going to have to cut these costs. And, uh, it, and so they miss out on, yeah, but what could we be doing at the top line? I mean, should we be looking at another form of income? Should we be another revenue stream? What other things that we can do? Um, we have one company that they had an explosion in their plan. It was a terrible safety thing. Um, it was at night. They lost five of them. Um, they were going to rebuild the mill into a state-of-the-art, safe, highest safety mill. But that took two years. And the majority of people worked there. They didn't lay off a single person. If somebody left, didn't replace them, but they found other jobs. They had them manning phones, had them visiting the families that had lost people and doing shopping for them or doing whatever else they needed. They, they got people to get to what they, they found other companies that needed good people and they loaned them out. Um, they continued to pay them and keep them on their payroll and then the company paid for the work that they did. So, I mean, there's so many creative things that can be done and that just doesn't happen. Yes, I read a, a situation here in Brazil. There was a, a company with 20 employees. They, they produced uh, music instruments. Uh, and during the, the crisis, they were not selling anything. And the boss, the owner of the company, called them and said, we need to do a meeting because I have no more money to pay you. I've been paying you for three months without no revenue at all. And I want to listen from you, what can we do? And one of the guys said, we are used to produce uh, hand stuff like uh, instruments there. Why not produce face shields? We, we can do this, we just change. We produce uh, plastic stuff over here. We can, we can do this. And they started doing this and they recovered it all and, and everything and they didn't uh, laid off anybody, they didn't terminate anybody and they, they are making more money. So as you said, if they decided to fire people, to lay off people without listening to them, the solution would go with them. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a, also in our company, the, the CEO in the beginning of the crisis, he said, he called to the managers and said, we are not terminating anybody, laying off anybody. This is the easiest thing to do. So if you are the managers, find a solution. That's excellent. And so this was something that I, I pleased him in person because he, he challenged us to do a better job. And that's what a leader should do. You know, believe in, the, in your team potential and, and, and everything. And yeah. before we go, because the time runs a lot, uh, I want to ask you uh, about the, the high performance workplace that is the dream of our companies. Uh, and I, I want to share a, a situation as well. When I, 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 I'm lucky for having good bosses and I'm a kind of, a, a, I'm not too emotional, I'm more reason people and, and I kind of dry. My mom says, hey, you have to dry. Blah, blah, blah. And all my, my bosses were always human and like polite and everything. And I, in, during the evaluation process, I always told them, hey, uh, someday I will become a boss 
like I, my boss. But I, I'm so my my the way I I don't know I cannot explain, but the way I am doesn't allow me to be like they are. So have you heard something about it, like personal characteristics interfering in the because you know and they told me you have your own even this they they told me uh, you have your own way you get the results and you don't need to smile to everybody you have a good heart and everything but in my mind i, I had then as a as a ideal bosses you know, uh, does it happens to more people is it's just myself becoming crazy or <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. With, I agree exactly with what they said. Everybody's got their own style, and I think the most important thing for a leader is to be authentic. If you're not authentic, if you're not yourself, people know it, and then they don't trust. So trust is the key to me. Trust and respect, and you. you I mean, um, I'm not funny. I wish I was, but I'm not funny. Um, and one of the people I worked for made me laugh all the time. And I thought, gee, I wish I was like that. Well, I'm not. Um, I'm not. Same situation. <laughs> I, I can, it's just not funny. And, and so, you know, I have to accept that I have other strengths. Um, I have to be who I am. I have to be authentic, um, pluses and minuses, and constantly working on the minuses, but not trying to be somebody enough. And, and I think as long as we have good motives and good intentions, and we care, um, and we show that we care, that's, that's all anyone needs to do to be a great leader. Okay. Have I forgot any question that you want to answer and I missed? I, I don't think so. The only thing I'd add, because we've talked a lot about um, creating that safe environment and creating a, one that's creative and, and good for people. The other thing that goes to performance, though, is high expectations. And if you think people are very capable, and that they want to do well and they want to win, then you need to have high expectations and communicate those. And, you know, keep coaching people up. Um, not pointing out what they're doing wrong, just giving them tips to get even better. Um, and you, you don't do that if you don't have high expectations and people can't reach their um, maximum potential if you're not setting the bar high. So the only thing I'd say is we've talked a lot about how it feels, you know, how, what your mindset needs to be and so on. In addition to that, to be high performance, you've got to carry those positive assumptions about people into high expectations. Perfect, yes, that's really worth to be mentioned. So how can we reach you if we need help in creating high performance workplaces we want to share uh, your contacts books uh, the, the company everything feel free this is the the marketing time <laughs> you you are so wonderful to ask um we we could be reached at our website which is um www.hpwp for high performance workplace group.com and you know we've got all the information there all the things that we do you know talks about them there um and so on we're we're doing a lot of virtual work now um mostly what we've always done before has been on site or with groups of people but obviously that that's not safe now um so we've just been doing um we just did a virtual workshop the other day with a, with a company where we had 24 participants. But we broke smaller groups and really discussed uh, issues. And that was, that was you know, so value added for them. And they, it was only 90 minutes, but they were thrilled. 
and we gave them an assignment and some of them already completed it and we just talked to them on Friday. So it's a it's it's changing. Yeah, you know, we could have given up. We could have said, you know, one of the hallmarks is our interpersonal communication and relationships that we build. Well, you have to take a look at that and say, we're gonna to have to do it a different way. And we're gonna to have to restructure our training a different way. Um, and by seeing Yes, totally agree. New times. Thank yeah. you, have, stay safe. And I hope we can talk soon <laughs> again. You too, you too Hugo, I'll, I'll stalk you. If I don't hear from you, I'll, I'll, I'll find you again. And find <laughs> out. Bye bye. Bye bye.